Hello everyone, this is Shreyas here, your physics master teacher at Vedantu. Today, we are going to revise the entire chapter of center of mass, momentum and collisions, which is particularly very important for J as well as NEAT aspirants. And we are going to do this in a very crisp and systematic manner so that you can use this session again and again for your revisions and also just before your examination for last minute preparation. So let's get started. Now, most of you would have seen this balancing bird toy and you would have seen that it balances itself no matter how you try and disturb it. Now, the concept behind this as well as the concept behind a person trying to walk on a rope using a stick is very similar. All they are trying to do is try and keep the center of mass in the vertical line above or below the pivot and try to maintain the center of mass as low as possible. Now, what exactly is center of mass? Well, that's nothing but just a point where the entire mass of the body can be assumed to be concentrated. It depends on the shape, the size and also the density and how the masses have been distributed. Also remember that the center of mass will not change its location if you try and reorient it or try to take it to some other place because remember mass is not dependent on gravity but it is only dependent on the amount of matter. Whereas the concept of center of gravity depends on the gravity itself it's a point where the weight, which is the force due to gravity, is assumed to be concentrated. So if you take the same body to some other planet or some other location, you will find that the center of gravity would have changed and the center of mass wouldn't have. If you want to find the location of the center of mass of two point objects, all you need to know is the masses and their locations. The coordinate of the center of mass is given by a weighted average formula which is m1x1 plus m2x2 upon m1 plus m2. Now the same objects are present in a 3D space, then the x coordinate formula remains the same as before. The y and the z coordinate formulas are similar, just that the x terms get replaced with y or their respective z coordinates. Now if you have more than two masses, then these formulas will change little bit the terms in the numerator and denominator will have some more entities and it will look something like this. You will have x coordinate given by m1x1 plus m2x2 plus dot 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 till the last product of mass and the coordinate. Notice for every coordinate of the center of mass, the denominator always contains the total mass and the numerator is always a product of mass and the respective coordinate along that axis. Now these formulas are to be used for discrete systems that is the particles are distinct and you can locate them very distinctly. But if you have objects like these where the mass distribution is continuous then you need to hypothetically divide such a continuous body into infinitely small masses which are nothing but dm. Now the formulas of the coordinates of the center of mass which contains summation will now be replaced by integration. You can again see the denominator always contains the total mass and the numerator is nothing but summation or integration of the respective coordinate with the elemental mass. Now the good news is most of the times you might not have to actually sit and evaluate these integrals or summation because of some kind of symmetry present within the body. For all the objects which have a point symmetry and are homogeneous, the center of mass is located at the point of symmetry. But for all those objects which have a line symmetry and they are symmetric about some kind of line, the center of mass formulas needs to be memorized. For example, for a solid hemisphere, the center of mass lies on the line of symmetry and it is at a distance of 3r by 8 from the base. Similarly, for a hollow sphere, the center of mass lies at a distance of r by 2 measured from the center of the base. Now, for a cone, the center of mass again lies on the axis of symmetry and from the base, for a solid cone, it lies at a distance of h by 4 whereas for a hollow cone, it lies at a distance of h by 3 again measured from the base. Now, imagine somebody gave you a pizza without eating the crust that becomes the arc of a circle and the center of mass for such an arc lies on the angle bisector at a distance of r sin theta by 2 divided by theta by 2 where the distances are to be measured from the center and theta is in radians. Now imagine you got the entire pizza for yourself. Well, that's a sector of that circle 
and the center of mass again lies on the angle bisector and it is at a distance of 2r by 3 into sine theta by 2 divided by theta by 2 again measured from the center and remember theta is in radians. If the particles of a system move, obviously the center of mass of the system might also be in motion. In fact, it might even accelerate. The motion of the particles, if known, you can easily find out the velocity of the center of mass which is given by m1v1 plus m2v2 till the last term mnvn upon the total mass. Similarly, you can also find the acceleration which is m1a1 plus m2a2 till the last term mnan upon the total mass. And the momentum of the system is nothing but the total mass into the velocity of the center of mass. This total momentum is nothing but the vector addition of all the momentum of each particle. Now, if the particles are in motion, there might be some forces and the relationship between the forces and the motion is given by Newton's modified law for a system of particles. If you have external forces acting on a system of bodies or particles and the forces are not balanced, then it causes the center of mass to accelerate. This net external force is going to be equal to the total mass of the system multiplied by the acceleration of the center of mass. Notice that the internal forces have no role to play in the acceleration of center of mass. It's only the external forces which contribute to the acceleration of the center of mass in the direction of the net unbalanced force. The Newton's modified law highlights the essence of center of mass chapter. If you throw a bat in air, you will find that the different points on the bat move in very weird and random paths. But there is only one point on the bat which continues the journey of a parabolic trajectory. Now that point is nothing but the center of mass. That's where the entire mass of the bat is assumed to be concentrated and there is only one single force acting on it and that's the weight of the bat. If you were to sit on the center of mass and look at the bat, you would only see rotational motion. But if you are a ground observer and then only looked at the center of mass, you will only see the parabolic trajectory which you have already studied in projectile motion. Similarly, if a projectile were to explode mid-air and different fragments will fall at different places, you will still see that the center of mass will continue its journey as if nothing has happened. That's because the force of explosion is an internal force. That's how you can figure out the location of different fragments if the location of other fragments were known by you. Remember that when the net force is balanced, then the acceleration of the center of mass is zero. And that's how you solve the classic problem of man and the boat. So if the person jumps or moves to one side, the boat recoils to the other side. And remember, in this problem, the person applies some force on the boat, which is internal. The external forces are assumed to be absent, and that's why the center of mass stays there. So if you know how much the person has moved onto one side, you can quickly figure out how much did the boat move onto the other side. When you have two planets revolving around each other because of their mutual force of gravity, that force becomes an internal force. Due to the absence of any external forces on this twin planet system, you will see that their center of mass will not move and both the planets actually end up revolving around their common center of mass. If you are enjoying this video, do not forget to go ahead and smash that like button out there because that's the only way you can show your love and support towards me. Now let's talk about momentum. Any body which moves possesses momentum and it's nothing but the product of the mass and its velocity and it's a vector quantity and the direction is in the direction of the motion of the body. The formula will be P bar is equal to mass times the velocity. Now if the momentum changes, that quantity is called as impulse and it can be easily shown by Newton's second law that the impulse which is the change in momentum is also equal to the force which acts multiplied by the time interval for which it acts. The unit of impulse is same as the unit of momentum and when a large force acts for a very small time and changes the momentum significantly, it is said to be impulsive in nature. All those forces which do not change the momentum significantly are said to be non-impulsive. Impulse 
can also be calculated by area under the force versus the time graph which also tells us that impulse is the integral of force with respect to time. Now that we have spoken about momentum, let's also talk about when it is conserved. Now the law of conservation of momentum states that the total momentum of a system remains constant only if the net external force is zero. Now even if the momentum is conserved, it is not compulsory that the total mechanical energy is conserved because during the collision or explosion, you might find that the energy is lost in the form of heat, light, sound and other forms. Also remember that even if you are a non-inertial observer, you can use this principle provided you have taken into account the pseudo force and the sum of the pseudo force and the other forces should add up to give zero. It's also important to note that the internal forces cannot affect the total momentum of the system even though they might change the individual momentum of the particles. Now the interesting fact is that even when the net force is not zero, you can use this principle in the perpendicular direction to conserve the momentum. For example, when you shoot this bird and at the highest point, the gravity is acting down, but the momentum will be conserved in the horizontal direction, which is perpendicular to the net force. You might often need more equations to solve the problem and that's where coefficient of restitution comes to the rescue. Now that's a constant for a given pair of bodies and it's nothing but the ratio of the relative speed of separation after the collision divided by the relative speed of approach before the collision. Now collisions can be categorized into three different types. The first one is elastic where you can think of a ball which is dropped and endlessly bounces off without losing any of its energy. In those cases, the restitution coefficient is one. Now the more realistic scenario is where you drop a ball and it slowly loses its energy into different forms and the value of the coefficient of restitution in those cases is less than one. Now the third category is where a ball or an object goes and sticks to another object and moves along with it. Maximum energy is lost in a perfectly inelastic collision and the value of the coefficient of restitution is zero for those kind of collisions. A lot of mistakes can easily be avoided by following some simple tips and guidelines. Always start by identifying the system of interest and also identify which kind of forces are internal and external. Keep in mind that the internal forces do not affect the total momentum of the system. Also, it's a good practice to draw the situations before the collision and after the collision separately to avoid any confusion and to get more clarity. After that, start writing down the law of conservation of momentum in the equation form where you put all the momentums before the collision on one side and all the total momentums after the collision on the other side. Keep in mind that you need to take into account the signs because momentum is a vector quantity. If the collision is happening in 2 or 3D, then you need to write additional equations in Y or Z direction. Now, if still the number of equations are less than the number of unknowns, you might find additional equations from the energy or the restitution equations. You can also use a simple trick for two-dimensional collision when you have a ball which collides with a smooth inelastic surface. You will see that the incident angle and the reflected angle are related by the coefficient of restitution is equal to tan of i divided by tan of r. There are some simple situations for elastic collision where energy is not lost, which you must remember, which can save you a lot of time in the examination. The first situation is where a ball collides with another identical ball in 1D and you will see after the collision, their velocities get exchanged. Also remember this, that if a tiny object collides with a very massive object which is at rest, then after the collision, the tiny object comes back with the same speed and the big object remains there as it is. And in the reverse scenario, where a massive object collides with a very tiny object at rest, after the collision, you will see that the massive object continues to move with the same speed, whereas the tiny object moves with twice the speed. Now, if you have a ball which collides with an another identical ball at an angle, but that should be at rest, then after the collision, both the bodies move 
in perpendicular directions to each other. Now, if you all love this video and you are really excited to watch more such videos, do not forget to extend your love and support by smashing that like button and hitting the subscribe button out there. And you can also get in touch with me on my Instagram handle, which is Shreyas underscore Vedantu.